Congratulations on completing the last exercises on generating exponential random variables. You now just have one more task to complete and then you'll be ready to tackle the first assignment for the module. Before we get onto that, however, let's first briefly review what you did in order to complete the last task. In the last task, you learned how to generate exponential random variables. The algorithm that you wrote to complete this task worked by generating a uniform random variable using the now familiar tools from NumP. We then assert that the value of the uniform random variable is obtained is a value from the cumulative probability distribution function for the particular value of your exponential random variable. We can thus simply read off the value of the exponential random variable by using the inverse function of the, for the cumulative probability distribution function. For the particular case of an exponential random variable, the particular inverse function you used is given by the expression shown at the bottom of the slide. In this expression, u is the uniform random variable that you generate using numP, and x is the final value of your exponential random variable. In this final video, we want to focus on the final type of random variable that we might be interested in, a normal random variable. You can generate normal random variables by using an algorithm that, similar to the one I just explained for the exponential random variable, works by generating some uniform random variables and then transforming them in order to get a normal distribution. This algorithm, unlike those for generating the other sorts of random variables we have seen, uses math that is really tangential to the subject of this module, and so I don't want to teach it here. Instead, I am thus going to suggest that you use another intrinsic function from NumP to generate your standard normal random variables. This function is called using the code shown here. This code will generate you a standard normal random variable from the distribution that is shown at the top of the slide, i.e. it will genera generate you a normal random variable from a distribution that has an expectation of 0 and a variance of 1. If, by contrast, you would like a random variable from a normal distribution with an expectation of mu and a variance of sigma squared, you simply take a standard normal random variable that is generated using the code above and transform it as shown at the bottom of this slide. Using the NP random normal function is relatively easy, so there is no task that simply tests that you can use this function. Such a task would be beneath you by now. The next task instead asks you to compute an estimate of the probability density function for a standard normal random variable by taking a large number of samples and estimating a histogram. This task is similar to the first two tasks in this exercise, but there are a few subtle issues here that we will deal with during the remainder of this video that come about because we are now dealing with a continuous random variable. The first of these issues is that the standard normal distribution has infinite support. That is to say that the random variable can take any value on the real axis between minus infinity and plus infinity. This problem is easy to resolve, however, once we recall that the state shape of the probability density function we are sampling from will look something like this. This shape ensures that there is little to no likelihood that we will get a value that is in the tails of the distribution. We can thus truncate the range of values that the random variable might take between minus 4 and plus 4, as shown here. There is still a problem, however, as the random variable can take any real value in this range, and because there are an infinite number of real numbers in this range. Consequently, if we were to count how often each random variable came up, as we did when we were computing the histograms for the Bernoulli and multinomial distributions, we would end up with a distribution that had delta functions centred on each of our sample values, something like this. We would not see any real number come up more than once, and worse still, we would need to have an infinitely long list in order to count how often each of the infinite real numbers appeared in our samples. Obviously, we do not do this. What we do instead is divide our range up into a discrete number of intervals, and we count how many of the samples are in each of these ranges. For the example shown here, we thus have two samples in the second range or bin, one sample in the fourth bin, one sample in the fifth bin, 
one sample in the sixth bin and one sample in the eighth bin. This hopefully seems easy enough, but let's see how a computer program does this, that does this sort of calculation works in practice. Here is the full code to calculate and plot a histogram by sampling from a normal random variable. Let's not panic and let's instead, and try to understand it in all, one, all in one go, but let's instead go through this piece by piece. To begin, let's focus on what these lines here are doing. This first line sets the maximum and minimum value that our random variable will take. As discussed on the previous slide, we have to truncate this range when we compute histograms for a Gaussian, but this should never be a problem in practice unless the range we choose is stupidly small. What we are essentially guaranteeing by setting x min and x max here is that our random variable will fall in the range shown in the diagram here. We can thus safely divide this range into n bins disjoint segments or bins. In the code, we divide the range from x min to x max into 20 such bins. In the diagram, however, we will keep things simpler by dividing this range into just four. Let's now turn to the second line of the code. This line creates an empty list that will ultimately contain the x coordinates for each of our bins. This is the list n bins. We'll come back to this momentarily. What we want to focus on here is the meaning of the variable bel x. This quantity is calculated by taking x max minus x min and dividing this difference by the number of bins. Del x is therefore the width of the bins as shown in the diagram. Let's now come back to the setting of the x values for the bars. Let's come back to the setting of the quantities in the list x bins. The values of the elements in the list are set by the for loop shown here. If you look at this loop and think about what it is doing for a moment, you should be able to see that it is setting the elements of the list so that each takes a value at the centre of each of the bins as shown in the diagram on the right hand side. Now that we have set up the list with the x coordinates for our bar chart, let's turn to how the y coordinates are set. The y values that are plotted and plotted are set in the code lines of code shown here. Most of this code should be reasonably familiar as it is just generating a set of samples of the random variable. The two key lines in this code are here. These are the lines that generate the normal random variables and that count how many of the random variables fall in each of the various bins. We will illustrate how these two lines of codes are able to do this operation diagrammatically in the top right hand corner of the slide now. The first line generates our normal random variable that will most probably lie somewhere in the range between 0 and 4. Let's say that the value of the random variable is here. The second line, the one with the math.floor command, then transforms rand so that bin has a value which if it is multiplied by del x and if x min is added to it would fall here. Let's think about this step another way because it is the hardest step in this whole procedure. Let's suppose that our range between x min and x max is here, just slightly to the right of the origin at x equals 0. Subtracting x min from the random variable that we generate essentially ensures that the value we will get out after the subtraction will be between x max and x min and x max minus x min as shown here. Now let's consider what happens when we divide by del x. Del x, remember, is equal to the width of each of the bins. Consequently, when we divide the random variable we've generated by del x, we turn a number that is between 0 and x max minus x min to a number between 0 and n bins, as shown here. Let's now turn to the final piece of the puzzle, the math.floor function. When we take the floor of a real number, we essentially take the real number and chop off all the numbers that appear after the decimal place in order to get an integer. In other words, we round the number down. The net result of the line involving the matchfloor function is thus that if your random 
if your random variable is in the first bin, you get bin equals 0. If your random variable is in the second bin, you get bin equals 1. If your random variable is in the third bin, you get bin equals 2, and so on. We can thus use the value of bin that we get out to decide which element of the list of y vowels that counts each time one of the bin ranges appears needs to be increased by 1, as shown on the line in the code after the one that computes bin. These last parts of the code are then very simple, and are similar to what we did when we were calculating histograms for discrete random variables. In essence, we normalise the distribution, which involves dividing each element of y vowels by the number of samples we generated. Then, once we've done this, we plot the data. The only slight difference between what we do here and what we did in the previous exercise is that here we need to divide each element of y vowels by the width of the bin, as well as the number of samples. This procedure essentially ensures that the integral of the probability density function, the area under the curve, is equal to 1, as it should be. Hopefully, this is now clear enough for you to complete the final task. Good luck with that task and with the assignment on random variables.